Yes, the investors hold what's called a beneficial interest in the trust, which the IRS ruled uh, as far back as like 2004. There's an IRS ruling that says that they recognize that as uh, direct real estate ownership, um, which is one of the requirements for the 1031 exchange. So from a investment standpoint, they get all the same benefits as they would as if they owned a property outright. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network CREPN Radio. This is episode number 88. This is the podcast where we focus on investing in commercial real estate. We do this through weekly conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Gross. In just a minute, we're going to speak with Drew Reynolds. Drew is the Vice President of Real Estate Investments at Realized Holdings. Realized Holdings is a marketplace uh, for 1031 exchanges. And uh, this is not just the uh, one for one plus, uh, you know, larger property, but this is the, the place for the investor who has a gain and uh, wants to leverage into a stabilized Class A asset in a major metro city and uh, would likely not be able to do so. It'd be a little out of your league. Uh, they accomplish this through the Delaware Statutory Trust. And uh, if you've never heard of this, it's, um, it's a unique structure that provides the investor the uh, ability to invest with other investors while accomplishing a 1031 exchange, which is something I didn't know that you could do. And uh, I think you're going to find this uh, incredibly interesting. And uh, it's something that every investor should learn about. Uh, before you do listen, or, or uh, if you're driving, and, and uh, I want to remind you to check out the show notes. Uh, in the show notes, Drew provides a, uh, it's a 36-page, uh, glossy, uh, visual, well-written uh, explanation of how the uh, Delaware Statutory Trust works. And... Um, you know how it can benefit you, and I encourage you to uh, check it out. It's it's an incredibly uh, well written, good summary of of what we're uh, talking about. And um, uh, let's see. Okay, before we before we get on with the program here, I want to remind you a couple of quick things. If you're on social media, uh, go ahead and reach out to me. I'm on. Uh, I think I'm on all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't say all of them. I, I know I'm on the 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 major ones. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, also most recently the Snapchat. Uh, you can find me at uh, J. Darren Gross on all of those. It's the uh, letter J, Darren, D-A-R-R-I-N, Gross, G-R-O-S-S, and uh, look me up and let's connect. Uh, also, if you want to follow the show on uh, Twitter, uh, it's uh, at C-R-E Pro Network, and uh if you're on LinkedIn, I want to encourage you to check out uh, the um, group we've got. It's called Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. It's a, a great place to network with commercial real estate professionals. All right, let's get on to the show. This morning, I'm pleased to have my guest, Drew Reynolds. Drew is the Vice President of Real Estate Investments with Realized Holdings based in Austin, Texas. Uh, Realized is an online crowdfunding platform that allows 1031 investors to exchange into replacement property interest in one or more institutional quality replacement properties. Drew, welcome to the program. Hi, Darren. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for doing this. Glad to, uh, glad to have you, and I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, our talk today. Uh, before we do, if you could do me a favor and, and tell the uh, listeners a little bit about you and uh, your path to uh, Realized Holdings. 
Sure. So, um, you know, my background is is heavy in the commercial real estate industry, um, starting off at some of the Wall Street investment banks on the lending side and then moving into the the big brokerage houses, um, as is the, the background of the other folks here. Um, so we've transitioned from taking our uh, what I'd say institutional level real estate knowledge and now being able to apply it to help individual investors um, with the tools and resources in that level of expertise to make decisions on an individual basis. And as we'll touch on here in a moment, really as it, uh, as it applies to 1031 exchanges um, as their opportunities often change from what they're, they're accustomed to. Got it. And uh, specifically the, the um, uh, topic we're, we're going to jump into today is uh, just that the, uh, the 1031 exchanges and, and uh, nuances and and essentially that that question that I don't think a lot of people when they're investing uh, think about too much, but it's uh, how are we going to get out of this uh, property and uh, not lose everything or not lose all of our gains? And uh, so with that, I'm wondering if if it would be good just to kind of uh, start with some basic uh, information about. Uh, what happens when somebody sells a property and, you know, what are they faced with? Yeah, absolutely, Darren. And I I think you're exactly right. It's a, it's a, you know, it's easy to run the numbers getting into the deal. Um, What we often find as investors are, are frankly shocked to learn what their tax consequences are when the property comes due for sale. And one, um, Real important note that I want to bring up here is the difference between uh, profit, meaning what you sold the property for versus what you bought it for, and how capital gains are actually taxed, which is the difference between what the property is sold for, um, but it's minus what's called your adjusted basis. And I, without diving you know, <laughs> too deep into accounting terminology for the sake of our investors here, um, basically, as you're claiming depreciation over the term of holding a property, it reduces your basis. So what happens at some point uh, further down the road when you go to sell the property is it's not just that profit that's being taxed, but if you are in a situation where you've owned an asset for a long time, it could really be upwards to the entire sale price that's being taxed. Um, now, you take into that federal capital gains rates, you layer in some local and state capital gains tax. Depending on your income tax uh, rate, there could also be a Medicare surcharge on top of that. And then there's something called depreciation recapture. Um, depending on where you are, it, when you add all that up, it could be as much as 30 or 40 percent um, is a, is a capital gains and depreciation recapture tax when it comes time to sell. And as I mentioned, if you've owned it for a, a long time, that could be on the entire sale price, not just the profit. Um, <laughs> so when investors do those numbers, we all, sit, all of a sudden see them start uh, panicking and like, whoa, you know, that sounds like um, way too much. Um, fortunately, there is a mechanism that you can defer all those taxes, and that's the 1031 exchange. Um, Briefly, what a 1031 exchange is, is a provision in the tax code that says when an investor sells an investment property, and this is a key distinction here, it has to be an investment property, it does not qualify for a primary residence, but really any other type of investment property does qualify. You then have 45 days from the sale to identify uh, potential properties that you're going to buy, and then you have a total of 180 days to, to purchase the, um, the property. Uh, and of course, there's a few tax rules in there about um, how the numbers have to, to balance out. But essentially, if you meet the timeframes and the accounting requirements, you can defer uh, all your taxes provided you reinvest in investment real estate. Okay, and and that much I'm familiar with, and I, I thank you for kind of uh, summarizing that because I think the uh, if you don't start the conversation with that, you can miss a lot on this. Um, one thing I want to back up to, and uh, you, you said you didn't want to dive deep in it, but I just you, you kind of cued me here. Uh, the adjusted basis um, is that essentially the the uh, uh, another way of saying kind of recapturing your de- depreciation when you 
Yeah, so the, the simple definition of adjusted basis, it, it's your purchase price, and then you can add to that any capital expenditures, so not repairs, but if you put a new roof on a building, you can add that to your basis, and then you subtract out, um, yeah, basically depreciation. So residential properties are depreciated on a 27-and-a-half-year schedule, commercial on a 39-year schedule. So for us, we often see individual investors who own, let's just take a single family rental home, but they've owned it for 20 years. So one, they, let's say they're in uh, California and they bought a property for $200,000 and they've owned it and they've depreciated it down to $50,000 and now they sell it for $400,000. Well, their, their, their gain is not the difference between the four hundred and the two hundred. dollars the gain is the difference between the 400 and the depreciated, the adjusted basis of 50. So you're being taxed on 350 instead of 200. So you can see where if you've owned a property for a long time and claimed depreciation on it, the, the taxes really add up quickly. Right. No, absolutely. It, it'll uh, kind of slow down your, slow your roll, as they say, uh, <laughs> when you uh, get the excitement, uh, bring it to a stop. Um Okay, so we we've kind of uh, outlined, um, you know, what what happens or, or the you know what a uh, seller is faced with, and uh, the you've kind of uh, laid out a little bit about the ten thirty one exchange. One of the things that I've been led to believe, and and uh, I was looking forward to to uh, this specifically because I think you dispel it or provide a way around it is if if I own a property whether it be as an individual or in an entity, I've always been under the impression that the new property that, I've, that I'm purchasing has to be held in that same entity uh, in order to qualify for a 1031 exchange. Is that? That is correct. What you're referring to is something that's called the same taxpayer provision. So if you own property in an LLC, basically the LLC is eligible for the 1031 exchange. But the individual investors, so say four of you, you and three of your friends put together an LLC. When it's time to sell the property, um, all four of you could go together and do a, a 1031 exchange, but you cannot break up the, the LLC and go your separate ways. There are really only two legal structures that allow um, really two things. One is, I'd say, the splitting up of those uh, partners, you know, for, for all four of you to go their separate ways and also to allow individual investors to come into a structure um, as individuals who are not previously partners or, or, you know, related to each other in any way. One would be what's called the tenant in common structure, structure and the other is really what we focus on, which is something known as the Delaware Statutory Trust. Got it. Okay. So why don't we, uh, can we go into uh, each of those just a little bit to uh, describe? Cause, and maybe just, so let's kind of keep this, uh, I want to make sure we're summarizing each point so we don't get uh, down the path and not know where we're at. But so if, if I've got a property and uh, I'm, I've owned it for a number of years and I've got this gain, and let's just stay with the, the example you laid out there, the California home. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a four hundred thousand dollars sale. I've got three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of gain. Uh, I'm uh, made aware of this, and I'm freaking out. And uh, I find out there are options, and uh, I contact you. Um, can you spell out for me the the uh, the two options here? Uh, sure. So the as of right now, we're, we do not offer any tenant in common or tick structure. Uh, that does work well, we believe, when there's a small group of investors who uh, know each other and are familiar with operating real estate. Um, the pros are obviously, like I, I mentioned, the ability to come together um, for parties who are otherwise you know, not known to each other or not in the previous transaction together. One thing that the tick structure does and a reason we've shied away from it is it does require um, unanimous consent to really do much of anything. So if you syndicate it out too far and you get into, you know, say there are 30 investors in a tick structure and somebody owns 1% of the deal, well, in theory, that 1% could block 
anything from happening by it since you're not able to reach unanimous consent. Um, so the tick structure as a syndicated product has pretty much gone out of favor. Uh, we still do see it happen with um, you know smaller groups of investors, and we, we put that together on a case-by-case basis, but it's not really something that we're um, actively offering. Yeah. The, yeah. The second avenue, which is really what we work on most of the time, is Delaware Statutory Trust, or DST. Um, it's kind of a fancy sounding name, <laughs> bit of a mouthful, but really it, it's quite similar to a limited partnership, but as I mentioned, qualifies for the 1031 exchange purposes. Um, different than a tick, the DST structure um, requires investors to be completely passive. So for some investors, they don't like that. If you're active in, in managing and operating a part, uh, properties, giving up control can certainly be something that doesn't work for you. And you know, if it's not for you, then you know, <laughs> like anything, uh, it's it's not for everybody. But what it does do is it allows it it gets rid of that um, holding an investor hostage. So uh, you know, type analogy where you've got the, the small guy blocking everybody else. Um, but really what it does is the DSPs are put together by very large scale operators. And I'm generally referring to asset managers or operators that have hundreds of millions or maybe billions of dollars of assets under management. I mean, they, they know what they're doing. So although you are totally passive in the investment, you're investing alongside um a large scale operator who really knows what they're doing. So in a lot of ways, it makes sense for the individual investor to kind of defer their decision making to the expert that's in the the field uh, every day. Got it. And just for uh, clarity, is that what uh, Realized Holdings provides? Are you guys that that sponsor of a of a, an investment? Realized is a is a marketplace, and what I mean by marketplace is we're a one stop shop to compare compare certain types of investments in a centralized place. So in this case, DSTs. So the analogy that I would use would be if you're if you're looking for a TV, we're we're Amazon, we're not Sony. We we carry Sony, but we also have you know Panasonic and Samsung. So we we have uh, basically the universe of DST offerings on our marketplace. The value that we add is through the technology platform. Similar to Amazon, investors can come on and easily compare the details or the features of the various investments on a side-by-side basis. Got it. Got it. Okay, so let's let's back up to the the DST here for a second. the the investor is going to be 100% passive if they if they choose to participate. Um, what kind of well in in the, the professionalism you you mentioned the uh, the sponsor of the of the um, uh, property or the and, and help me understand and define the the players in this so we can keep it all straight. But so we have the the investor. Do we have the sponsor? Yeah, the sp- sponsor and operator are really the the same term. It's the group that's putting it together. It's the you know the larger corporate entity that's that's putting the, the whole thing together. Okay, and then the the individual investors come in through the ten thirty one uh, or the Delaware statute or statutory trust. That's that is the vehicle that the investors are then allowed to become a member of or a part of. Is that right? Yes, the investors hold what's called a beneficial interest in the trust, which the IRS ruled uh, as far back as like 2004. There's an IRS ruling that says that they recognize that as uh, direct real estate ownership, um, which is one of the requirements for the 1031 exchange. So from a investment standpoint, they get all the same benefits as they would as at the Depreciation deductions, their share of interest deductions, uh, their share of cash flow. It's just in a much larger scale. Got it. Um, you mentioned uh, passive as opposed to um, active. Does that uh, 
I guess that's a whole uh, separate question. I was thinking about tax, uh, just on their taxes as far it, as... It, uh, is, uh, it, it doesn't really change anything in the tax returns. It is a requirement, <laughs> and without diving too deep into securities and, and tax laws, it is one of the requirements that allows this structure to work, is the investor needs to remain totally passive. So that's, that's an IRS thing. That's not... Um, something that's being required by the sponsor. That's that's part of the tax code. Got it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the types of investments that um, uh, are, are, are common. Can you give an example of a, a recent property that uh, was purchased? Yeah, well, I can speak in generalities. These, <laughs> these are uh, issued as securities, so I, um, I, I cannot speak in specific details of sure. security. Sure. Um, but yeah, look, on, on um, the small end of the DST, there's, there's no limit in the number of properties a trust can own. So that's another, I think, important piece to point out here is, is a DST offering can be anywhere from a single asset all the way up to we've seen portfolios with as many as 20 properties in them. Um, on the small end, we'd probably see an asset that's worth $10 million. And on the high end, we've seen portfolios worth as much as $250 million. Um, so what's common right now is um, Class A apartment complexes in major metro areas uh, portfolios of net lease retail with uh, investment grade tenants. We're also starting to see some student housing, medical office, self storage. Um, so really, it's the gamut of property types. Um, probably the big thing to point out here um, is the really more in the risk profile of what a DST is and is not. These are generally going to be what we would refer to as stabilized assets, meaning you're not going to see anything with a, uh, a development component to it or a real repositioning play. Um, so on the apartment side, it could be 95% occupied, newer construction. Um, so these are more designed to produce uh, steady recurring income than they are to be swinging for the fences. So these are not a uh, type of investments where you're looking for massive outsized returns. What they are designed for is to produce consistent income on a monthly basis. Right. And in my uh, understanding and, and um, uh, I guess, experience on this is, so if you are getting into a, like a Class A property that uh, is a more of a... Um, uh, you know, larger play in a metro area. Your your cap rates uh, tend to be fairly compressed. Is that, is that they are? This is another thing um, that's. Um, it will be the you know we're, we're in the business of selling DSTs, but I'll be the first to tell you they they're not for everybody. Um, one, as I mentioned, the passive, but two, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the yields. Um, there's a cost associated with with um, safety or with more of a core type profile. Um, certainly there's risk in every investment and every real estate transaction, but when you're going into um, you know, an A location in a major metro area uh, with newer construction without much in the way of future capital needs with a stabilized occupancy, you, you do pay for that in the way of yield. So yes, these are um, these tend to be a little bit more um, risk averse type risk profile, so lower yields, but it goes hand in hand with the risk you're taking. Right, and but on the other end of that, if I understand correctly, typically the uh, the gain on the sale is significantly greater than a, a property with a higher cap rate. Is that? Is that uh, true? Or? You know, that's a pretty broad uh, topic, and it you know it depends on the asset class and where the property is located. Um, you know, that's been the same. One of the old adages in real estate is you can either buy for cash flow or you can buy for appreciation. And the thought has always been if you're buying higher cap rate properties that you're not going to see much appreciation, whereas lower cap rates, you're sort of banking on some appreciation being there. Um our investors and us in general, we look at the world a little bit different. You got to remember that you're you're dealing with individual investors here who do not necessarily have a um, perpetual life to invest. You know, it's different than an investment fund or something going into it, and it's really about, um, in the most part, protecting their capital 
So when we evaluate and look at deals, we're focused more on downside protection than we are on the upside. So the analysis that we run is what has to happen in order to, at a minimum, return all my equity to me when the property is sold. And anything on top of that is really upside or gravy. <laughs> so that's that's kind of how we filter out deals as we look and say, what are they projected to pay? And then if we stress test those cash flows, does it still make sense? Can they still have a reasonable likelihood of making their payments? And is there a reasonable likelihood of, at a minimum, returning 100% of my equity? So we don't spend a lot of time on upside because in our experience, um, you know, that's just not where the investors are. They tend to be more conservative, more risk averse. And so upside would be great, but that's different than a lot of investors. That's, that's not the driving force behind the, the investment. So capital preservation is really the, the uh, appeal or, and I guess not necessarily the appeal, but that's really kind of where you start from. That's where we start from. It's not to say there isn't appreciation. We certainly <laughs> hope that there, there is some, but, but different than, um, you know, say a, a fund or even a more aggressive investor who might go in and say, I'm willing to take a 25% chance that I lose all my money with the 75% chance that I hit a home run. Well, our investors would look at that and go, you know, 25% that I lose my money, that, no, that, you know, that doesn't sound very good. They're really looking to minimize the downside more than they are to maximize the upside. Um, so we certainly think that there's, you know, a degree of upside in these, these properties, but, um, that's not how we're pitching it. And that's not how the conversations generally go. It's generally, um, safety first, you know, preservation of capital followed by consistent income. Um, and then we look at putting investors into different deals and to get in some diversification, so, yeah, it's more preservation of capital followed by consistent income. And then while we do look at appreciation, it's it's further down the road than perhaps um, some other investment offerings that are out there. Got it. Uh, the the properties that are um, being purchased in the uh, in the trust, are they uh, are they purchased for cash or are they is it a debt and equity? Uh, there's both. both. So one of the requirements of the 1031 exchange, and we talked about the time frames, but really in order to what's called balance your trade, you need to do a couple of things. One is you need to spend 100% of the equity proceeds and that cash that's received. Um, but two, um, I guess technically you don't have to, but from a practical standpoint, you need to replace equal or greater debt than you had on your, your previous property. Otherwise, you're subject to, it's called mortgage boot. Basically, you pay tax on the difference because the IRS says, hey, you're in a better position because you owe less debt. So therefore, it's the same as receiving cash. Um, so because of that, you'll see DSTs offered at different leverage points. Um, first, let's back up a second here. And let's talk about DSTs are um, what we call their prepackaged investments meaning the property is already owned. So there's no, uh, I shouldn't say no, but very little transactional risk to the investor. They're simply buying out equity that already exists. There's, um, you know, the sponsor doesn't need to go acquire the property. They already own it. Debt's already in place. All the due diligence is already complete. Everything's already in there. So you know exactly how much debt the various deals have. Um, and there are some that are debt free. So what that does is it allows investors to come in and find deals that meet closely with their leverage point that they need in order to balance the exchange, uh, either through one DST or through a combination of mixing and matching different DSTs to enable in order to get to the, the leverage point they need to, to balance their trade. Gotcha. Um, how, how long are these um, assets typically held? Is there a sunset on these or is there a time frame typical time frame yes so every dst there are all a little bit different they are you know individual offerings however they will have a stated target hold period um they are generally medium to longer term so anywhere from five to ten years um and there's they generally fall into one of two buckets either a five to seven year target hold or a seven to ten year target hold 
Uh, the reason being for that is uh, to the extent they have debt on them, there's usually a loan maturity date. And in the commercial real estate world, uh, seven or 10 year maturities are pretty common. And the reason for the range is to allow a little bit of uh, leeway, if you will, to, to balance economic conditions. And, you know, you don't really want to be in a position where you have to sell on a, an exact date, but, you know, giving a couple of years to, to play the market and sell when it makes sense. Got it. So let's follow uh, our uh, California investor who sold their uh, home after they owned it for 20 years, their investment home. They've uh, invested in a a DST. They've uh, come to the exit point five or seven or ten years later. Um, Are they eligible for another 1031 from that point? Yes. Um, So that's another advantage of the DST. And actually, it is a reason we see some cash investors go into the deal up front, meaning investors who are not coming out of the 1031, but actually just investing cash, is the tax-efficient nature of the DST. When the property is sold, it's no different than if you owned a property outright, like your rental home, from a 1031 and a tax perspective. Um, you're free to do another 1031 exchange and different than what we talked about before about the same taxpayer, the way the DST is set up, all the individual investors are free to go their own separate way. Uh, you could go into another DST, you could go back into direct property, you could buy a rental home, you can pay the taxes, um, or some combination thereof. Got it. Um, before uh, I forget here, um, just as a, a clarification, so somebody gets into the DST, um, how frequently can they expect any kind of uh, uh, income? Is it is it uh, annualized? Is it quarterly it, or is it? Yeah, there it's generally either quarterly or monthly. Uh, we've seen a trend to pay monthly. Um, and sometimes it depends on how it's structured, but sometimes we'll see, uh, you know, 12 monthly payments and then possibly a 13th payment the following quarter for any, you know, excess income that's above the, the projections. But it, it depends on how the, the type of property and how it's structured. If it's a net lease portfolio, you pretty much know what you're going to get, um, you know, paid in the day that it's going to get paid. Got it. Um, in, inside the the investment, we talked about the uh, preservation of capital and and uh, you know as a starting point. Uh, what if everything blows up? Is there any uh, risk that the the individual investor could become responsible more than their their investment? I mean, and I'm talking about everything, you know, everything coming and done. Uh, yeah. Um, the <laughs> short answer is there's risk in everything. You are taking equity risk as a investor in these deals. Um, hence the kind of looking for the lower risk profile type deal. So, you know, certainly a deal could not perform as expected. You are taking that risk. We want to be clear about that. Um, but from the more technical standpoint, there's a few um the kind of governing factors in place. One is, although there is debt in place at the DST level, the debt is non-recourse to investors. So if, for instance, the property value went to, let's just say zero, let's say, I don't, I don't know what happened, it's not worth anything, the lender would have no ability to come collect the difference from the investors personally. Um, now, they would get what's called debt forgiveness and a tax thing, but they're really the, these things are pretty modestly leveraged. So there's um, not much of an ability or really any ability for the lender to collect from the investors personally. Also, the trust itself has the same sort of protections as an LLC has on it, meaning you're isolated from both the sponsor and the other investors. It's actually structured in something that's called a... Uh, a bankruptcy remote entity, which silos off the investment from the, the, the corporate doings of the sponsor. So if you just think, um, you know, XYZ sponsor goes out and puts together four DSTs, let's, let's just say, and the corporate entity goes completely bankrupt, they go out of business, that does not drag the DST into it. You're, you're siloed off on your own. And same if other investors go sideways or, or whatever, doesn't affect you. 
Um, also, the DST, once it's raised, the, the offering is closed. So there's no ability for the sponsor to go back and make capital calls or ask for anything um, after you've made your initial investment. So if you put in $100,000, that's the extent that you'll ever need to put into that deal. Got it. Um, you mentioned there's there's all sorts of levels of um, uh, participation as far as investors getting involved. Is there a um, any kind of a common level of investment you see for people that have that have never done it that are thinking about doing it? Or uh, you mean on a, a dollar size basis? Yeah. Uh, so if you're coming in as a, a cash investor, meaning not in the 1031, then the administrative burden is a little bit easier. So those investments generally start down as low as $25,000. Um, and we do see investors do that um, sometimes to you know kind of test the waters, right? Put in a little bit of money to see if they like it and how it's operating. Um, the minimums can be a bit higher uh, for a 1031 investor. It really depends on the offering. Some have come down as low as twenty-five thousand. Uh, others will be as high as say a hundred thousand. Um, you know, typical size that we see is uh, kind of anywhere from on a ten thirty-one side, really anywhere from a hundred thousand on the low end up to uh, you know maybe two million. Um, is typical, you know, sometimes there'll be uh, larger investors that will, will come through, but, you know, for the most part, it's kind of that individual, almost mom and pop type investor. Somebody comes in and they've owned that house in California that we mentioned for 20 years and they've got, um, $300,000, which is a, a very meaningful amount, um, to them, but they're, you know, certainly not a, a institutional level investor or anything like that, but it's, it's very meaningful for what they're trying to do. Got it. Well, this is, uh, um, I mean, I'm just sitting there thinking about all of the the properties that, uh, you know, one runs across when they're looking for an investment and, and you get into these uh, booming or, or really growing metro areas and, and you quickly realize as an individual there's probably not a lot of likelihood that you're going to be able to pull off an investment in something major by yourself, but uh, getting involved in in a DST, it certainly seems like an opportunity to uh, you know to participate in some of those uh, those options. Yeah, absolutely. It's the you know the scale of investment, like you said, is is not really achievable on an individual basis. Um, you know, the other thing that we point out is because you can split up your investments and go smaller slugs into different deals is it allows investors to achieve a level of diversification that wouldn't otherwise probably be uh, achievable on their own. Uh, I mean, real estate, even even smaller properties are still relatively high dollar amounts. So for the individual that's got $300,000, I mean, what, what are their choices really? They could probably buy, what, one house, maybe a duplex, fourplex, something like that, versus, you know, taking $100,000 and putting it into three different deals, and now you're touching... 15 assets worth $300 million of real estate, you know, you've, you've lowered that risk profile significantly from, from a diversification standpoint and from just a scale of operation standpoint. Right. No, that's, that's, uh, that's a neat, um, well, it's just a, it's an interesting way to, uh, diversify, like you say, and also then, like I said, participate in these, um, larger, uh, properties that otherwise would be, uh, uh, out of reach, um, Drew. I'm I'm looking down my um, my list of thoughts and, and questions. Um, are we? I'm just looking. Is is there a, a a single best question that someone who, if they were interested in doing this, that they should ask or and get answered? Can you? The, the first thing that I am, it might seem like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many don't. The first thing, if you're considering a 1031 exchange, whether or not it's a DST, talk to your accountant and figure out what that adjusted basis is and do the numbers on what your potential tax hit would be. Um, you know, the flip side to what I said is depending on how the situation is, you might be pleasantly surprised that you don't owe that much tax. And, um, 
in some cases, <laughs> it's funny, you know, we're, we're in the business of selling DSTs and yet from time to time we get calls and we run the numbers and we tell somebody, eh, you know, maybe you shouldn't do an exchange. Maybe you should just pay your taxes. Right. <laughs> and there's other factors that can go in there. If you've got losses from other activities, um, you know, if you took a loss in the stock market, you may be able to offset some of your gains. So first things first is just get your head around the numbers. Um, and that will also tell you your, your pain point. At least you know what you're dealing with. Um, if it comes back that your potential tax liability is, is 50000 well, at least you know that, right? And now you can decide, is it worth it to do an exchange or should I just eat the difference or, or that? So I, I'd say that absolutely is the, the, the starting point. Got it. Got it. Um, is there is there any other information about a DST that I didn't ask you that we should uh, touch on? Uh, yeah, just in the, the interest of full disclosure, um, the one um, drawback. So I, I get a lot of questions about how is this different than a REIT. Um, the positive of the DST versus a REIT is the tax efficiency. So a REIT when it pays dividends, um, part of it is return of capital and part of it is income. So there is a degree of tax shelter, but not to the same extent as the income that's received from a DST. Uh, it's the same as owning direct property. So there's more uh, efficiencies on the uh, income side. But then also really when you go to sell, a REIT is not eligible for a 1031 exchange. Whereas when you sell out of the, the DST, you are eligible to you know keep all that money working for you. The downside is, um, I shouldn't really say downside, but you know something to be uh, considering is, is lack of liquidity. Um, these are private placements, which means there is not really a readily available secondary market. So if you did want out prior to the, the sale of the property, uh, legally you can sell your interest, but from a practical standpoint, it's, it's quite difficult and uh, the odds of taking a pretty substantial discount for doing so uh, is very real. So we tell investors, hey, look, if it says it's a five to seven year hold, you should really think like your money is going to be tied up uh, for that full seven years. If you need your money before then, that's probably not the right deal for you. Right, right. Well, and I think that's, that's um, well, uh, clearly when you're, when you're investing with others and stuff, you kind of do lose uh, your ability to be liquid in that, and, and I think that's pretty consistent on what I've seen. Uh, but yeah, definitely something that, that has to be uh, understood before jumping into something like that. Um, <clears throat> anything anything uh, else on this as far as uh, the, the DSTs? Uh, yeah, you know, just kind of regrouping maybe on the, the question you asked and something is um, another question that they ask is really risk profile. Um, one thing that we do here, even though we've got, we're, we're technology enabled, I'd say that makes, we've got the tools and resources, it makes it easy to find deals and compare deals. But really the um, the real benefit when you come to us is after you've, you know, looked through that and kind of filtered through it is, you um, you know, our backgrounds in real estate and finance and tax, and we can help uh, kind of weed through and really boil down to what the risk and rewards for each individual deal is. And where we find and often a disconnect that um, individual investors may not be thinking about is how much risk they're really taking uh, when they're looking at some uh, localized products. Like they might be comparing a single family house to a DST and saying, I can make a lot more money in the DS in the single family house. Well, maybe they can, and, and that's fine if that's the right deal for them. But, um, you know, it's understanding that risk and helping them get to that point. And are they getting compensated fairly for the risk they're taking or even understanding the risk? Um, so <laughs> we view ourselves more as educators. And like I said, it's their money. They can do what they, they want. But um, <laughs> we hope that they at least uh, understand the risks that are involved both on the DST side and on the, the sole property side. Well, and, and I'm guessing that in today's marketplace, there's uh, a fair amount of that. Uh, the blinders are on. The uh, market's been running up. And uh, how quickly we forget uh, 07, 08 and the corrections and and all that. And, and uh, you know, it's just... 
it's even a little more, you know, that obviously, but in some degrees, even a little bit more simplified. You live in wherever, so you know the area, you know, maybe it is the best area ever. But if you're banking on, um, let's just say, cash flow from your single family house, well, what we find is investors often, they run the numbers and they say, I'm going to make a 8% return, let's just say. And then we ask them, okay, well, have you, have you factored in any vacancy? Well, no, somebody lives there. Okay, well, what if they don't? What if they move out for a month? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, okay, what happens if the you know the water heater goes out? You know, are you going to eat three months worth of income because that happens? And just some of those you know types of questionings versus if you go into a DST and you've got four hundred units in an apartment building. You know, if ten of them are vacant, it doesn't really impact anything. And same with you know the repair and maintenance. All that is budgeted into the the. Um, the, the cash flow projections. So there's certainly a bit of de-risking through scale of operations that um, you know may not be apparent at, at first blush. Uh, like I said, one's not right or wrong. It's just you know, are you fully accounting for the risk on, on either side, and are you getting compensated um, based on the risk that you're taking with a certain investment? Yeah, I have. Uh, I have sat. I've probably parroted those words, thinking uh, when my. <laughs> My first uh, investment there, and and wondering why, <laughs> wondering why when the tenant wasn't paying, I wasn't getting paid. But uh, uh, I'm curious do you do you have any follow up conversations with those people? If it, let's say somebody does go into a um, a single family, is there any kind of a year or two later uh, conversation with those people? You know, it, it depends on the situation. If it's a one-off uh, trade and this is the only real estate they own and they decide to go into that, um, you know, not really. They, they've made their decision. <laughs> and um, We do have a lot of investors, as you might imagine, that own multiple properties. And so just because they made a decision uh, a year ago to buy a single-family home, um, they may or may not be looking at that um, again. And one other thing that we do, um, you know, why we might continue to take, talk to them is um, in addition to stacking up the kind of risk and reward is we also help with um, identification strategies. Um, there's a lot of rules you got to follow <laughs> how you identify properties in the, the 1031. So we help investors look at what they're doing on a holistic manner, um, whether that's DSTs, direct properties, or some of each. So we tend to get involved um, a little earlier and really, you know, almost like an advisor ish type role, or at least help them sort through the. Um, not necessarily advising, but asking them the questions and giving them the resources to make informed decisions and um, both an identification and investment strategies. Got it. Drew, I, I've learned a, a, a ton about uh, DSTs today, and uh, I, I, I'm just I'm excited to uh, uh, you know talk to others and, and see what uh, how the listeners respond to this. Um, I've got a, a question I want to ask you here, and this is something new that I'm I'm uh, putting out there to my uh, my guest here. I mentioned to you I'm an insurance broker by day, and and uh, one of the thoughts that I I thought maybe I should ask, uh, and we'll see where this goes. But if I say insurance, what's the first thought you have? Uh, I think about risk management, but uh, that's what what I think. Well, and that that's appropriate uh, given given uh, where you guys are coming from. That's that's uh, that's part of it. There, that's good. Drew, how can the listeners uh, get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more? Sure, um, they can visit our website, which is www.realized. 1031.com um, or they're I guess free to call me directly at uh, 512-827-3654 got it and I will uh, make certain to um, in the intro I'll, I'll uh, remind uh, the listeners Drew's made available a, um, a handout that is uh, incredibly uh, informative and uh, full of uh, information like what we've been talking about today and I would encourage all of you to uh, check that out. Um, and then also I'll, I'll have all the uh, show notes, uh, or in the, in the show notes, I'll have all the links to all the information as well. Um, so, Drew, I just want to say thanks again for uh, taking time for us today. Uh, I've learned a ton and uh, would love to do it again soon. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Darren. Well, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, the Delaware Statutory Trust is something I'd never heard of. And uh, it's clearly something that I think every investor um, is is going to want to know about at some point uh, when you've got a property that has a, a significant gain and you're looking for a way to preserve capital um, and uh, without paying the uh, uh, capital gains taxes and all of the depreciation, recapture, et cetera. Uh, it's clearly something you should know about. Um, be sure to check the show notes uh, for the link for that 36-page uh, uh, summary provided by Drew and uh, Realized Holdings. Uh, it's it's a, an excellent resource, and you will, uh, you'll be glad you uh, downloaded that. Um, before we go, I want to remind you uh, that if you like today's show, please let us know. The uh, easiest ways to uh, let us know is that uh, you can do that on iTunes. You can go ahead and give us a five-star rating and, uh, you know, go ahead and subscribe while you're there. That way you can listen anytime, anywhere. Uh, Let's see. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.